I got a gift card to give away here in a minute to in and out I heard there's a new in and out in Parker. You go in, and then you go out. It's a great place to eat. We got one at Castle Rock. Great place to eat, great place to hang out. It's Castle Rock's, Castle View's homecoming tonight, so my daughter's all getting ready for homecoming. I think Legend beat us at your homecoming, which is always a great thing. Hey, uh, when, I, when I was in Texas, I was a youth pastor, and we had a thing kind of like local. It was called D-Now, and so I was... Uh, over the middle school, uh, I was actually the next gen pastor, but I decided to be with middle school because they're just some of the coolest uh, students and they just do crazy stuff. So I had a ton of middle school guys, eighth grade guys. And so we get to our house the first night and most of you guys, like when you guys go to a host home, you stay overnight, what's your number one drink that you're going to bring? Dr. Pepper. How many Dr. Pepper fans? Mountain Dew, energy drinks, yeah, a ton of energy drinks. These eighth grade guys all brought jugs of milk over, okay? So I'm watching them, and I said, hey, you guys, like, what is the deal with all this milk? Like, I get milk does the body good, the, you know, the great commercials, all that good stuff, but why are you guys bringing milk? And they said, oh, Mr. Kip, they used to call me Coach K, uh, all the guys that I coach called me Coach K. So they said, Coach K, we're bringing milk because um, on YouTube, there's this whole thing called the Dairy Challenge, the Milk Challenge. And I'm like, okay, like you guys are going to have to explain it to me. So what happens in your system, in your stomach, we're going to do a little science thing here. I'm not going to have you do this. If Jack finds out that I'm ever telling you guys, I'll never come back to Crossroads. They won't even let me in the door on Sunday mornings. I'll have to go somewhere else to get my donuts and coffee. But the milk challenge is your stomach can only hold so much dairy, okay? That's why when you, you know, down a ton of ice cream and a bunch of shakes, you're like, oh, man, I think I'm going to barf, right? Your stomach can only hold so much dairy. After a certain amount of time, that dairy has got to go somewhere. It's either going to go up, it's either going to go down, okay? We won't get into the down part. But when it comes up, it is like a power puke. I mean, it is like a, a PVC pipe, like coming out of your mouth in projectile like vomiting. Okay. But here's the great thing. It doesn't really hurt you because you just ate it and then it's all going to come out. So these guys, these eighth grade guys, and, and we're sitting here filming these guys because it is so stinking funny. Like if we had be real back then, like we would be doing be real and showing you guys this. But so these guys are just outside, and they're just down in these gallons of milk, like these little eighth grade guys, you know, bigger dudes and stuff. And then all of a sudden, they just put the jug down, and they're like, hey, you guys, watch, 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 everybody get around. And then all of a sudden, they just, and it just like projectile vomiting. I've never seen anything like it. It is crazy. So that was like the big thing. But don't do that tonight. If you guys do that, Jack will kill me. But anyway, those would be like some B-real moments, and uh, it's still going on today. Like, you can YouTube it. Some of you guys are like, oh, I'm YouTubing it right now. I'm going to do it tonight. Don't do it. Okay, please don't do it. Okay, so the whole idea of B-real is it's an unfiltered photo with your friends each day. You got two minutes to share a random pic, and the goal is to give your friends an unfiltered glimpse into your life that is real, that is authentic. That is not fake. And the reason they do two minutes is because you can't stage it, right? You can't go somewhere and be like, hey, here we are. Like, you know, we're going to take a great pic of my friends. But it's two minutes. You got two minutes to get a real pic of yourself and what you're doing. It takes a picture of your face. It takes a picture of the outside. So we've got a couple of like realistic, be real pics that took place. Okay, let's throw those up. We'll come back to those questions in a minute. Can you guys see this? Okay, do you see all the way in the background what just happened? So this guy's in an Einstein bakery, bagels, and this car comes flying through, and I guess, like, must have to go to the bathroom or something really bad, but doesn't go through the drive through like, drives through the restaurant. Okay, look at this guy's face. He's like, you got to be kidding me. They do not pay me enough. I'm making minimum wage in Denver, Colorado, and a car just drove into my restaurant. 
Okay, let's go to the next one. Aww. That's up by Estes Park. How many of you guys been to Estes Park? The best place in the world. Okay, so he's like, oh, I love raccoons until it's like elf and the, the raccoon like jumps on you. Okay, the next one, one of my favorites. Here it is. Here's a B real pick. Oh, no. So he's like, I shouldn't have been texting while driving. And then he's, the other half is his leg is in an in inflatable cast somewhere, it looks like, in the desert. I don't know. There's no one else around. But, uh, yeah, a little bit serious for that guy, right? So he's like, yeah, this is real. I broke my neck, broke my leg. Don't know if I'm going to make it to the hospital. But I wanted to post this because i got two minutes of life left. Okay, so here's what I'm going to ask. Who knows what we talked about last night about Daniel's life? If you know, I want you to stand up real quick. I got an in and out gift card for you. Somebody over here, right there, right in the back. Come up here. Yeah, you. You need to tell me three things about Daniel's life. Then you got a gift card. You can get a double double. You can get those fries with they pour all the gravy and the crap over it. Okay, Deadpool. Yeah. All right. So tell me three things. Three things about Daniel's life. Go ahead. Okay, he was handsome, looked like Jack. Remember, I put the picker Jack up here. Okay, he had pink hair. Okay. Uh, he refused to dishonor God. Refused to dishonor God. Good. Give me one more. And he was a, he was part of Jerusalem when it got taken over. That's right. Judah, there you go, man. Good job. Okay, if you guys listen, I'm going to give out two gift cards tonight. By the way, there's no money on it. It's just a gift card. No, I'm just kidding. Get yourself a double-double, man. Number three. Okay. So, let's recap, okay? Let's recap. Oh, you know what? Put those questions up. I'm sorry. I got ADHD this morning. I had too, way too much coffee. Okay, you guys have two minutes. You have two minutes to get up. You have two minutes to get up, and it's, you're going to find six people. And as fast as you can, you're going to find out where they're going on fall break, which you have to use the most. One thing you laughed at last night. Ready? Give me some music. Go. Hurry up, hurry up, you got two minutes. Oh yeah, these guys are going, these guys are going. Come on, come on. Good, you guys, good, good. Two minutes. That's it. Two minutes. I'm watching. You've got 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Hurry up. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8. Seven, six. All right. Have a seat. Okay. How many of you are going out of the state of Colorado for fall break? Okay. Very good. Do you realize how many people actually come into the state of Colorado for fall break? Mostly Texans. Ugh. Texans, love Texans. They don't know how to ski, and they always make me wipe out on the slope. It's awesome. Okay, so you're going out on a fall break. Okay, somebody tell me which app you use the most. Over here, what's an app you guys use the most? Sooner? Oklahoma Sooner? Tell me which app you use the most. What is it? Pinterest. Pinterest? Pinterest and TikTok. TikTok? Netflix, Roblox, okay, good, what's one thing on this side you guys laughed at last night? Yes, what'd you laugh at last night? What's that? The photo of Jack, yeah, yeah, that's how actually Jack um, proposed to his wife and she was so enamored by his pink hair 
and she immediately fell in love with him because of his pink hair and he had a surfboard. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay, listen. Shh. All right. The goal. The goal is to give your friends an unfiltered glimpse into your life that is authentic, real, and it's not set up. In Daniel's life that we talked about last night, in Daniel 1.8, it says this. But Daniel resolved. In other words, Daniel set his heart. And just like Deadpool said, who came up, got the gift card. I don't know. Is that your real name, Deadpool? Yeah. Is it? Okay. I figured. Here's what Deadpool said, that Daniel made it resolved in his heart. Daniel stood. In other words, stood like planted his feet. It's like a linebacker, right, in college football. It's on today here in Nebraska. Sorry, Oklahoma. We are the only ones to have beaten the Colorado, uh, what is it, Buff? Oh, is it? Did they have a team? Okay, my bad. I thought it was just Dion and his sons. I didn't know they called it Colorado. All right, but anyway, <laughs> sorry, sorry, man. I know you're a buff. You're the, the, only, the only one in here. Okay, but Daniel resolved. He set his feet like a linebacker, right? Set his feet like he would set his heart. And then what he was saying is, I will resolve not to eat the royal food and wine. He asked the chief officials for permission not to defile himself in this way. You know why he did that? Because Daniel predecided. Daniel made a decision long before he got to Babylon that would say, it does not matter what happens. It does not matter if my life goes in the dark, if my parents split up, if my friends make fun of me, if I'm being mocked for praying in school or praying on the football field or praying before a game, praying on the diamond. I will not defy myself. I will make a decision, pre-decision, to follow Jesus. So our theme verse is Galatians 1.10. Let's bring that up. I want us all to read this, okay? Let's read this together. Am I now trying to get people to like me or God? Am I trying to win approval with people if I'm my, if my motivation was to satisfy people, I would not be a servant of God. So that's what God is asking us today, this morning, you guys. That's what God is asking you today. What is your motivation? Is your motivation in your life to be real, to be an authentic follower of Jesus, or is, it, is my motivation just to please people? I'm going to do whatever, whenever, whatever it takes I'm going to look the right way. I'm going to say the right things. I'm going to do the right things to get the motivation of people, to get the motivation of my friends. I'm going to post the right things on social media. I'm going to make my identity something that's not really me, but on the outside, I'm going to look the right way so I can influence the right people around me. Because what we talked about last night, the last thing that any of us in this room, whether you're middle school, high school, an adult, we never want to make the wrong decision. We don't want people to know. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want people to really see what's going on inside. But some of you, here's what's cool. Today, all the leaders got together. We had breakfast tacos. And, and Bryce just said, hey, let's talk about the wins last night. And Pete got up and, and the, one of the other leaders, and they were talking about how some of you guys in your small group have been really transparent. Like you're buckling under the load of just junk and stuff in your life, and you're just being very transparent about, here's, what, here's what's going on. Like here's really what's going on. And if someone could really take a, a, a be real pick of my life, my heart inside, like you'd see like on the outside, man, I'm looking really good. Man, I show up and I look the part. I wear the right clothes. Man, I say the right things, but inside... And I just wish, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back and redo some of those pictures. I wish I could redo some of those moments, some of those experiences. I have those. You have those. Daniel had those in the Old Testament. Okay, so we're going to recap. King Nebuchadnezzar is brainwashing how many teenagers? Four. Four. Into becoming the best and brightest, what? Israelites? Babylonians, right? His desire is to change their what? Their identity, right? Change their mind. Not to follow God, not to follow Jesus, but to follow a new way. 
By the way, you guys right here, you are in the spit zone. Like I spit all over when I talk. So you guys, I'm just telling you, I can move back. But, but some of you, you're going to get a little bit of my spit in your hair. That's okay, because it'll heal you. You'll have amazing hair because of that. Okay, so not to follow God or Jesus, but to follow a new way. Anything they wanted, they can have. So the royal official got to Daniel and those four, four teenagers. You guys must be looking this up on your phones, right? You're in Daniel, looking it up. So they're looking at it. The, the official is saying to Daniel, look, you can have anything you want. Like you can have any gift card to the Alamos. You can get online. You can buy anything you want. The only thing is, it has to be Babylonian stuff. All they had to do was follow a new way. All they had to do was leave their faith and follow the world. They, had, they could leave their identity of what they knew everything to be right, their values of growing up in Jerusalem, of growing up in the land of Judah, where Jesus Christ would come out of, right, the city of David. And all they had to do was forget everything that was behind them and just point their feet point their heart in a new direction. And you guys, just like I was telling you last night, the exact same thing, don't miss this. Don't miss this. The exact same thing is the exact same thing the enemy wants to do in your life right now in 2024. We're not talking about something anymore that happens in the Old Testament. We're talking about something that that Satan wants to do right now in your life in 2024. He wants you to get you to point your feet and to point your heart in a new direction of not following Jesus Christ anymore, but following a different way. And that way is, man, point your feet in the way of following whatever it takes to fit in, to be that guy, to be that girl, to laugh at those jokes, to look at stuff that is sexually temp tempting and to show your buddies, to look at TikTok and look at this stuff that is like soft porn and go, man, isn't this hilarious? And everybody in the locker room laughs, but inside you know, at the end of the day, when there's nobody around and you're laying in your bed at night, all that stuff comes rushes back in because here is the trick of Satan. Here's the trick of your enemy. He's going to entice you to follow stuff that is not right, and then he's going to reward you with more stuff that seems right, but then when you're all alone in bed at night, and there's no one around, and there's no more noise, and there's no more static, and you've put your phones down for the night, that's when he starts heaping all this guilt on your life. And he's saying, see? See what I made you do? And you fell right into it. You fell right into the trap. See what I got you to do? I, I got you to start looking at some TikTok stuff, and then some TikTok stuff went into soft porn, and now I'm hooking you in to pornography. And it's something you're going to get addicted to, and I'm going to entice you more and more and more so that you start seeing guys in a way that the world sees, and you start seeing girls in a way that the world sees, not through the eyes of God. And so in Daniel chapter 3, we pick it up, okay? Here's what it says in Daniel 3, chapter 3. You guys, you can, you can pull up your Bibles, find it on your phone. Some of you are writing it on your legs right now, which is really cool. You're writing Daniel chapter 3, 1 through 3 on your legs. It's really cool. Very committed. Okay. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, 60 cubits wide, and set it up on the plains of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, ju judges, magistrates, and all the other prince, prince, provincial officials, I cannot speak, to come up to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the sea traps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Okay, so here's how crazy King Nebuchadnezzar is. Okay? King Nebuchadnezzar says, look, I want to find out who is fully committed to my kingdom. I want to find out who will fully point their feet and follow me as their king. Because a king in that day was considered to be a god. So 
Every governor, governor, leader, advisor, judge, magistrate, you're all going to come. But not only are you all going to come, you're going to bring everybody under your ju- jurisdiction. Under your, uh, wherever you have authority, you're going to bring all those people. And he sets up, he makes this gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And he sets it up out like it would be like on the way to DIA, to Denver International Airport. So everybody that's driving to the airport is going to see this 90-foot tall structure, nine foot wide of pure gold. Okay, so I've got a contest. I want to know who you guys think is the best. Let's put these up, okay? This has been going on for decades, for generations. Even before these people were born, we have been debating who is the best, right? We got Caitlin over here, and we got Angel, and then we've got, I don't know who the guy is on the left, but the guy here is, is Michael Jordan, okay? Oh, is it LeBron? Okay, my bad. Um, all right, so by a vote of clapping and cheering, we're going to go through these four, and we're going to find out right now who is the best, okay? At Crossroads Church, right here in the garage, we're going to find out who, be- who is best, Okay. Who do you think, how many of you think that LeBron could beat Michael Jordan in one-on-one? By clapping, cheering, how many could think that LeBron James could beat Michael Jordan? Okay, let's flip that around. How many of you think Michael Jordan could beat LeBron James? Good, good. I love you guys. I love you guys. Okay, let's turn it over here. How many think that Angel could beat Caitlin? Nobody? Yeah. Two? Three? Okay. Let's flip it. How many think uh, Caitlin could beat Angel? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many think, how many could, do you, how many of you think that Caitlin could beat Michael Jordan? Yeah. How many of you would say Michael Jordan would beat Caitlin? Yeah. Okay. How many are like, I don't care, I don't even know who these guys are? Okay, that's all. Okay, but here's my point. Let's say that Caitlin is like, you know, in Indianapolis, she's like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe how popular I've come. Like if you fly into Indianapolis airport, I had to do that this summer, and I wanted to get my, my little girl down here, Lily, she's my little girl, not really little anymore. But I wanted to get Lily some Caitlin Clark stuff, so I went to all these shops around Indianapolis. Guess what? You cannot find any Caitlin Clark stuff in Indianapolis. It is sold out. Like, it's crazy. All the merchandise, all of her stuff, all sold out. So what if Caitlin Clark says, I'm the best ever, and I'm going to build a statue 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and I'm going to set it up right outside of Indianapolis? And when the sound goes off, I want everyone to bow and go, oh, Caitlin Clark, you are the best WNBA player forever. That'd be really weird. But King Nebuchadnezzar does it. Look in verse 5. The herald shouts out, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the scyther, the lyre, I don't know what a scyther is, the pipes and other musical instruments bow to the ground to worship When you hear all those musical instruments, I want you to bow to the ground and worship. Lily, sit down. I want you to bow to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar. All right? Anyone who refuses will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Okay? Put up this next picture. This is the largest arena in the world. Yeah, can you guys imagine this? Okay? This is in North Korea. It's the Rangundu arena, and it can seat 150,000 people. If, if they have a concert or they open up the field, 200,000 people can seat, can be seated in this in North Korea, okay? They didn't build it to watch soccer. They built it to the guy that's like the communist leader right now in North Korea. They built it as an attribute to him to go, hey, we want to have the biggest arena in the world. That's why they built it. But can you imagine at Babylon, in Babylon at the time of this writing of Daniel, there's 200,000 people in the, in the city of Babylon. And what, 
what, what's supposed to happen is all nations, tribes, and tongue, when they hear the sound of, of all the instruments, they're supposed to fall down and worship King Nebuchadnezzar. They're supposed to fall down. So you can picture, like in this stadium, if we could put that picture back up. Thank you. If we could picture in this stadium that right in the middle, we're going to build this nine-foot statue, nine-foot wide, and when the, when the jumbotron comes on, and when all this music starts playing, everybody in this arena is going to bow down. Everybody's going to bow down. But look what happens. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 8, it says this. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whatever, whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. Verse 12, but there are some Jews. There's four teenagers. There's four teenagers in this arena. 200,000 people are bowing down. The Jomotrons are like giving everybody the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And everybody begins to bow down all across this arena. And off in the distance, we can put that, we can leave this picture up, please. Off in the distance, let's say like right here, 200,000 people, right here on the edge of this balcony, there's four teenagers. There's four teenagers who are like, nope. And they're standing just like this. There's four teenagers and 200,000 people, and they're standing right on the edge of that balcony, and they're like, nope, not going to do it. Don't care about the countdown. Don't care about being thrown into a fire. We're going to take our stand because we believe in God. We will obey God. We're not going to obey the world. And that's exactly what happens. They, and and what's, what's crazy is 200,000 people. And off in the distance, there's three boys, four boys standing to their feet. They don't hesitate. They didn't slowly begin to rise. They didn't like get down on their knee and like, oh, man, I hope nobody sees us. They didn't even just raise up their hands like, okay, let's, let's bow, but let's just like raise up our hand a little to be like, hey, we're kind of half committed, but we don't want to burn. We don't want our, our flesh to melt off our bodies because it's going to be intense. We don't want to die. When the music starts, four teenagers are like, I don't care what happens. I don't, want, I don't care what happens at Legend High School. I don't care how, what happens at Pondo. I don't care what happens at Lutheran. I don't care what happens in our middle school. I don't care what, what's going on in our families. I don't care what's going on when I'm being made fun of. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to disappoint myself in the face of God. My identity is found in Jesus Christ, and I will not bow. Because real faith obeys God not the world. That's the big idea, you guys. Real faith obeys God, not the world. Daniel 3.12 says, but there are some Jews you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, king, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. And tonight, this morning, you guys, I want to ask you this. doesn't matter if you're in sixth grade. doesn't matter if you're a senior in high school. Listen to me. doesn't matter if you're a small group leader or an adult here today. I want to know this today. Where is your identity found? Where's your identity found? Is it found in sports? Is it found in stuff? Is it found in the right people around me? Is it, is it found in where you live or what your parents do or the money that your parents make? Where is your identity found? Your friends. It is in the lies that you make up on social media that you can become whoever you want to become. Is your identity found in being fake, not real? Is your identity found in when you get up in the morning and you look yourself in the mirror and you go, I don't like who I've become. Like I'm addicted to stuff that I shouldn't be looking at. I'm cutting myself and I'm just patching up my arms so nobody will notice. Where's your identity found? Psalm 101 verse 3 says this, I will not let any worthless thing guide my heart. That's David. That's like King David saying this. King David had everything, 
And in Psalm 101, he writes, I will not let any worthless thing guide my life. The only thing that's going to guide my life is the person and work of Jesus Christ because he has the power to change my heart. But many of us in this room, myself included, we give our hearts sometimes over to things that are worthless. And then we lay in bed when we're by ourselves and we're like, man, I can't believe I made that decision today. I can't believe I said those things. I can't believe that that my friends think of me in this way. And we've all been there. But Jesus turns around and says, man, if you will let me guide your life, you'll have freedom. You'll have freedom from darkness. There's a story I once read, and a great, cool, cool story about these Navy SEALs. And you guys know, like, you know, I don't, like, if, if we could put a picture up here of a Navy SEAL, I mean, there's these ginormous guys, you know, probably all tattooed up, and they, there's just nothing, right? There's nothing that they're afraid of. I mean, they go into the face of danger, and they're like, man, we'll take a bullet, we'll do whatever for our country. Like, we've been trained. Like, some of the intense training these Navy SEALs have, but there's a story about these Navy SEALs, and they go to some of the darkest parts of the world on this undercover, like, uh, op, like this special ops, and it's just a few of them. There's about seven of them, and they go into this POW camp. They sneak into this, this camp, this POW camp, and during the nighttime, in the darkest part of the night, they sneak in. They've got all this ops, all these lasers, you know, all this stuff that they can see, all these heat sensor stuff, so no one's going to notice that they come in and they come out. But they get to the POW jail, the prison, and they bust the lock on the door, and they open that prison door, and all of a sudden, all these prisoners that are in this prison, they all back up and rush to the darkest corner of the prison cell. Now, these Navy SEALs are like, hey, you guys, like we're, we're from the United States. We're Navy SEALs. We've come to rescue you. We've come to, to bring you freedom. We've come to get you out of prison. And, and all you got to do is just trust us and walk out. They show them the doorway, like, you guys, come on. But all these POWs, all these prisoners of war, they're so afraid because for so long, they've lived their life back in the darkness, back here in this corner. And they can see that the door is open. They can see that there's freedom. They can see these Navy SEALs telling them to come. But they're like, no way. We don't trust anybody. We're going to stay back in the darkness because that's what we know. And that's what we're comfortable with. And it's better to stay in the darkness than to take the risk of walking out in freedom, not knowing what to do. So the Navy SEAL, the guy that's in charge, like the chief, you know, remember movies like, you know, chief officer, you know, the chief, like all these Navy SEALs turn and they're like, they won't follow us. Like, what are we going to do? The chief petty officer goes, well, I've got an idea. So he takes off his helmet, takes off his night goggles. Shows his face to these prisoners. And he takes his weapon, his big old, you know, semi-automatic rifle, and he lays it down on the ground, and he walks back slowly to these prisoners. And he's got these big, gigantic hands, and he takes his arms, and he just wraps his arms around one of these prisoners. And he begins to whisper in each one of the prisoners' ears, trust me, I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to take you to freedom. And one by one, this big petty officer grabs these prisoners who are just weak and under nutrition, and he picks them up, and he walks them out the door to freedom, one at a time. And one at a time, each one of those prisoners begin to trust him because they see his eyes, and they see his compassion, and they see his love. And you guys, here's what I want to tell you, that Jesus Christ has done the exact same thing that many of you would love to just stay back here in the darkness because you feel guilty, you feel shameful for things you've done, and the enemy of your soul wants to keep you back here in the darkness. But Jesus comes in and he offers a new way. He says, I can bring you freedom. I want you to trust me. I want you to follow me. And your life will forever be changed if you follow Jesus Christ out that door of darkness and into light. 
Let me pray for you. Father, I pray today just for each one of these students. Father, we, we have no idea what's going on in their lives. But you see it. Your word tells us like the darkness is like daylight to you. And so, Lord, if you know everything about us, and we also know that nothing grows in the dark, Lord, allow us to bring the junk that we're dealing with out into the light today. As these students meet with their small group leaders, I pray that they would just be open and transparent, be able to talk to guys like Jack and Bryce and, and Eli and, and the other the, the staff team and to their small group leader about what's really going on, to be real and to open that up and not to hide in the darkness anymore with that junk, but to follow you out into freedom, into life. Lord, we love you. Allow us to worship you now. 